Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew again. And in this video, we are going to talk about cell respiration. So we're going to be breaking down glucose. We're going to talk about what happens when you do it without oxygen. We're going to be talking about what happens with oxygen and a lot of the different processes. This is going to be a packed video, so I'm going to get right to it. All right, so first we're going to describe the processes that allow all organisms to use energy stored in biological molecules. So just as a quick refresher, when we look at organisms, we classify them as either being autotrophs, things like plants, algae, bacteria that can make their own carbohydrates from raw materials specifically carbon dioxide and water. And then we also have heterotrophs, which are things like animals, fungi, and bacteria that have to consume other organisms in order to gain energy. Regardless of whether you are an autotroph or a heterotroph, whether you have the ability to build those carbohydrates or not, all organisms, once they have those carbohydrates, will break them down using forms of cellular respiration. Sometimes it is without oxygen, we call that anaerobic respiration, and sometimes it's with oxygen called aerobic respiration. And some organisms have the capacity to do both anaerobic and aerobic respiration, depending on the specific situation it's in. All right, so it's important to say that fermentation and cellular respiration use energy from biological molecules to produce ATP. Respiration and fermentation are characteristics of all forms of life. So what we will see is that in the case of fermentation, fermentation is when we've broken our, down our glucose and we've produced our molecules of pyruvate. And if we were going to go through aerobic cell, cellular respiration, once we've completed glycolysis, we take those pyruvates and we will bring them into the mitochondria. But not all cells are able to utilize oxygen in order to do that. And sometimes organisms live in oxygen poor environments. And so that's where we get into the process of fermentation. Fermentation is synonymous with anaerobic cell respiration, and that's breaking down the pyruvates into smaller carbon molecules, either ethanol or lactic acid, in order to produce two ATP. Now the two ATP are produced through the process of glycolysis, but by undergoing fermentation, we're able to recycle the NADHs that we produce through glycolysis, and we're able to then make NAD plus so we can continue to go through glycolysis. All right, now cellular respiration in eukaryotes involves a series of coordinated enzyme-related reactions that capture the energy from a biological molecule. And so in the, this instance, we're showing glucose is being broken down by glycolysis to form pyruvate. And in glycolysis, it's a series of enzymes that break the glucose down into pyruvate. Then if there's no oxygen, it's going to break down using the process of fermentation. But again, series of enzymes that's going to do that. All of these ovals that are shown here, glycolysis, fermentation, oxidative decarboxylation, which is the formation of acetyl-CoA, the Krebs cycle, electron transport, each one of these is a whole series of enzymes that are involved in a process of taking an organic molecule and bringing it down in order to yield ATP. In the case of each one of these steps, there will be dozens of enzymes that is going to be part of that process. So electron transport chain transfers energy from electrons in a series of coupled reactions that establish the electrochemical gradient. So a couple things in here. A coupled reaction, if you recall, is the idea that as energy is released from one step, energy is going to be then stored or captured by a separate reaction. And so there's this is what we refer to as a coupling reaction. So the electron transport chain occurs in chloroplasts and in mitochondria and also in some uh, prokaryotic plasma membranes. And in every instance, what it is, it's a series of proteins that allow for electrons to fall from a high potential energy to a slightly lower potential energy to a slightly lower potential energy state. And as those electrons fall down that electron chain by being passed from one molecule to the next, the slow drop in potential energy of those electrons is going to be used to pump hydrogens across and stack a whole bunch of hydrogens on one side of a membrane. And this, again, is a conserved process that we see in multiple domains of living things all eukaryotes, and in large swaths of prokaryotes who also have a similar mechanism in order to concentrate hydrogens on one side. Now, once you have a high concentration of hydrogens on one side, you can control the movement of those hydrogens through the membrane, through an ATP synthase, and to capture that energy. Now, 
Additionally to this, we know that cell respiration electrons are going to come to that electron transport chain through the creation of molecules NADH and FADH2, and they're passed through a series of electron acceptors as they move towards the terminal electron acceptor which in our case is going to be oxygen in aerobic cell respiration. In photosynthesis, the terminal electron acceptor is NADP+, which forms a molecule called NADPH. That is going to then be used after it's been created in the light-dependent reactions, in the light-independent reactions. And aerobic prokaryotes use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, while anaerobic prokaryotes use other molecules. This is going to be enormously diverse because there's many different types of prokaryotes that will use a similar mechanism in order to gain energy. So we see that in every single case, there's going to be an electron donor and an electron receiver, and the electron transport chain is going to be uh, allowing the high energy electrons that are in an NAD H or an FADH2 or one that was excited by a photon in the case of photosynthesis, it's going to allow them to drop down and be accepted by a final terminal electron acceptor. Now, we know the transfer of electrons is accompanied by the formation of a proton gradient, as I mentioned before. In the case of the mitochondria, it's going to be across an inner mitochondrial membrane, and the internal membrane of a chloroplast does the exact same thing when we're talking about in the chloroplast. And the membranes are going to separate these regions where the low proton concentration is going to be on one side and the high on the other. And then in prokaryotes, we're also going to have a double membrane system, and the passage of electrons is going to be accompanied by the movement of a proton across that plasma membrane. So again, in each of these cases, we're using the electron transport chain to pump hydrogens on one side and control their movement back over in order to make our energy. So... How does this all come together in the end? The flow of those protons back through the membrane-bound ATP synthase by chemiosmosis, and chemiosmosis is the diffusion of those hydrogens, that chemical, from the area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And what we're going to see here is the this movement of those is going to drive the formation of an ATP from ADP and an inorganic phosphate. This is known as oxidative phosphorylation in cell respiration and photophosphorylation in the case of photosynthesis. It's oxidative because what we've done is we created those high energy electron transporters in the NADH and FADH2, and those lose their electrons. They're, they're oxidized, um, and there's the electron loss involved in that instance in order to create this energy. And the reason we call it photo phosphorylation is that it's the photon that excites the electron up to that higher energy state that ultimately drives the electron transport in photosynthesis. Now, the electron transport chain is going to ultimately lead in cell, cell respiration to a decoupling oxidative phosphorylation from that electron transport, and it's going to generate some heat. And that heat ultimately is going to be used by endothermic organisms to regulate body temperature. You may have already thought about it, but we maintain a constant body temperature. And the question is, well, how do we maintain that constant body temperature? And it's through our metabolism. Part of that metabolism is that as you break molecules apart, as you transfer energy. Every energy transfer is going to be a little inefficient, and those little inefficient energy transfers are going to produce heat. That heat accumulates and can actually be what causes the overall body heat of a given organism. So again, electron transport uh, chains are transferring energy from electrons of, through a series of coupled reactions that establish that electrochemical gradient, and heat is going to be a byproduct of all of our chemical reactions. So how do uh, cells obtain the energy from biological macromolecules in order to power their cells? Well, the truth is, is that there's a lot of different types of um, sources that we can use that we could bring in at different points during cell respiration. And so here what I have is the formation of pyruvate. We know that glucose can lead to the formation of pyruvate. But you can also break down fats or glycerols from lipids and make pyruvate. You can also break down a whole series of amino acids and make pyruvate. For other amino acids, we will break those down to produce other molecules such as acetyl-CoA. So anytime you have an organic molecule, those molecules could be entered into the parts of the process that are going to be used to make ATP, NADH, 
and FADH2. And if they can enter into any of those first sets of reactions, then what we can do is we can use the carbon molecules as an energy source to produce those electron carrying hydrogen molecules and then bring those to the electron transport chain to produce the high amounts of ATP that we'll ultimately get. So we know, again, that glycolysis is that biochemical pathway that releases energy into glucose to form ATP from ADP in inorganic phosphates. We also know that NADH from NAD+, and we make pyruvate as well. And so what you can see in these instances is that this is how it all starts, that we start with glucose. But as I showed you in the previous molecule, you could have a fructose molecule, or you could have some other molecule that could then come in and add in to produce some pyruvates. And as long as you are going through the process to make pyruvates, you will have the raw materials to get started into going to make acetyl-CoA and ultimately to get into the Krebs cycle. Now, pyruvate is the transport molecule from the cytosol to the mitochondria where further oxidation is going to work. And so again, we've made some ATP during glycolysis, uh, uh, and then we make those pyruvates, and it's pyruvate that is converted into a sealed CoA that ultimately enters the citric acid cycle. All right, so the Krebs cycle is going to have a lot going on. One thing is we're going to take the carbon dioxide and we're going to release it from organic intermediates. So ultimately, we're going to take those carbon backbones and bring them down to zero carbon. So the carbons come in, six of them come in as glucose. We get rid of a couple of them when we make the acetyl-CoA. We get rid of the rest of them when we go through the Krebs cycle. We're also going to synthesize some more ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphates. And then really the big thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a whole bunch of NADHs and FADH2s from every pyruvate that goes in. Remember, one molecule of glucose is going to produce two pyruvates. Each of those pyruvates will enter and go through the citric acid cycle. So every time you see a cycle like this, anytime you make an an NADH or an FADH2, that is going to be something that's going to happen twice as, twice as often before those go on to the electron transport chain. And then lastly, as we mentioned earlier, the electrons extracted from glycolysis in the Krebs cycle uh, are transferred to NADH and FADH2. Those are going to come to the electron transport chain. And what we see is that NADHs and FADH2s come in we have that inner membrane of the mitochondria inside the mitochondrial matrix, and we're going to strip the hydrogens off those NADHs and FADH2s. They will get pumped into that inner membrane space to create a high concentration of hydrogens. Those hydrogens then can only come back through one port, which is that ATP synthase, in order to make the ATPs. When the electrons are transferred between the molecules in the series of reactions as they pass through that electron transport chain, that electrochemical gradient is what is really going to power the pumping of those hydrogen ions across to create that gradient. The last thing to note is what we talk about in the electron transport chain is really an aerobic process. You only will go through all of that process if you have oxygen to be the final electron acceptor and form that water at the end. If you lack oxygen, as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to be able to get that big 34 ATP yield from the electron transport chain. And so what you will see in those instances is that the glucose has been broken down into pyruvate. And rather than having those NADH molecules just be wasted, you are going to see a recycling of NADHs back to NAD pluses so that you can go and produce the two ATPs of glycolysis over and over and over again. So while it is nowhere near as energy efficient to produce ATP, you know, two ATP per glucose molecule, it is going to be far more efficient to get some ATP than to make the NADH molecules that ultimately have no end point. Now, the conversion of ATP to ADP releases energy, which is then used to power cells. So the question is, why do you make all this ATP? And the fact is, is that ATP puts phosphate in a case where it's a high energy, big giant cloud of electrons that can be bound to a substrate, and it creates a much more unstable, high potential energy molecule 
in the form of a phosphorylated substrate. And so what we will see is we'll take the phosphates off of ATP by breaking them and binding them to that substrate and make ADP. Then that ADP will then go back into a process like a glycolysis, like a Krebs cycle, or most often back into a case where they will use the uh, electron transport chain and use those hydrogens coming through in order to make a more ATP molecules, and then they become higher potential energy molecules. Those high potential energy molecules have great potential to do work, and then they'll go back and phosphorylate more substrates. So you're constantly recycling those ADPs back to form ATPs by sending them to locations where the ATPs are made through cell respiration, and then they go out and do work by phosphorylating molecules any place in a cell where there needs to be an energy transfer. All right, so that was a ton of information about cell respiration. I know there was some of it was a little repetitive, but hopefully it was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.